welcome. Uh, you're tuning in to um, the virtual celebration of the book, A Like Vision, The Group of Seven and Tom Thompson, hosted by the McMichael with some of the book's contributors. And tonight we've got with us Jennifer Beishwal, Gerald McMaster, Gina Roy, and John Sasaki. My name is Grace Johnstone and I'm the Director of Communications here at the McMichael. We'll get started in just a few minutes. But I'll begin by acknowledging that the McMichael Canadian Art Collection is located on the original lands of the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe people. It is uniquely situated along the Carrying Place Trail, which historically provided an integral connection for Aboriginal people between Ontario's lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. As an institution, the McMichael recognizes the importance of acknowledging the original territories of the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe First Nations people. Tonight's talk is being recorded, so if you miss any parts of it, it will be available in the next few days on our website, mcmichael.com, and on our YouTube page in the coming days, and we're also streaming live to Facebook tonight. If you would like to ask a question, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Simply move your cursor around and you'll see it. And if you type your question into the Q&A box, it will be sent directly to the panelists. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can uh, at the end of tonight. There are over 400 people joining us tonight, so we'll try and get to your questions as much as we can. And if you haven't bought the book yet, here it is. Whoops, it's heavy. <laughs> it's There's heavy. still time. Um, it can be purchased uh, in, at the gallery in our gallery shop um, or online at uh, shop.mcmichael.com. And I would hasten to add that there are a very limited number of autographed copies still available, signed by Ian and Sarah, who you'll hear from tonight. And those are available for ordering online through Sunday, December 13th. So put your holiday orders in now. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, despite the many ups and downs of this year, we've been so happy to have so many of you along with us as we've brought more of our content online. You might have tuned in to Ian's presentation on May 7th about the anniversary of the Group of Seven or Sarah's webinar over the summer about Maude Lewis, which was delightfully uplifting, or some of the talks that we did during Art Toronto about our uh, exhibition Early Days Indigenous Art at the McMichael, which is on now. And um, it's been wonderful to connect virtually with so many Canadians and people around the world. And we've been proud to bring you this content for free. But during the holiday season, if you are able to make any donation to us, it does help us to continue to bring this content to you online, wherever you might be. And that's exhibitions, books, and um, presentations like tonight. So there are three ways to donate and uh, you'll see a QR code on your screen. Um, if you take a photo of, if you open up your camera and take a photo of that uh, QR code, you'll be sent a link to the donation page, or you can text the word McMichael to the phone number on your screen, or you can visit the website to make a donation, either our donation, uh, our, our website rather, or the URL on your screen. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the McMichael's chief curator, Sarah Milroy, who I might add has become a recent recipient of the Order of Canada. Oh. And she'll be introducing tonight's <laughs> panelists. And I'll come back at the end uh, with lots of questions from all of you. With that, over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, we're delighted to be with you all tonight. Um, we, this was our COVID baby. And there've been a few of them I hear uh, from the folks down at Mount Sinai, but this is, um, this is ours, uh, which is uh, a book that captures really the beautiful exhibition that our director Ian Desjardins uh, put together with our exhibition designer, Eric Pearson, just as um, we came into the new year last year. And uh, it gathers together our really remarkable collection that we have at McMichael of Tom Thompson's work and the works of the Group of Seven. We realized when we went into COVID that all this work was up on the walls and we had, I, I guess we thought we would have more free time than we ended up actually having Ian, but we thought we were gonna have enough time to, to comfortably do a major, major publication on the Group of Seven. As it turned out, we had just enough time to do a major publication on the Group of Seven and Tom Thompson and this lovely book that you see before you, of course, on the coffee table. This could be your coffee table this Christmas, so I need to be crass, but you know, it is very beautiful uh, with McDonald's um, emblazoned across the uh, the cover. 
such a gorgeous painting. And we have, of course, this is up in the gallery now. Um, and it is hefty. You saw our uh, darling Grace practically spraining her wrist, trying to lift this up to the camera view a few moments ago. It is a meat of book. And all of the images in it have been color corrected to the original works of art, which was nothing short of a mega feat um, given um, COVID social distancing and all the issues we were dealing with. But we realized that we had an opportunity really to make a book in which the color values because all the work was gathered, we could actually move from, from painting to painting and color correct against the painting itself, which is never done. And what we discovered was that um, the colors were very different than had been published in earlier publications uh, over the years, that everything had progressively gotten browner and browner as the decades have gone on. But now we've brushed off the cobwebs and we really have a, a book for the 21st century on these very radical, uh, and surprising artists. And here's our title page. What we wanted to do with the book was really achieve two things. One was to, in a way, take people back to the time when the pictures were made. So to, to return people to the time when the group of seven were not so much of a known commodity, when they were this kind of, you know, ragtag um, group of uh, ruffians, this is how we see them in the canonical picture of them in the Arts and Letters Club. But this is actually, sorry, much more, I've got a cursor here that's being a little frisky, much more the way that they were together when these pictures were actually being made. These are from the archives that were given to us by Lismer's wife that have sat in the McMichael archives and had not really been mined before. And, and people might recognize some of these images, but some of them, you know, are new. And we decided, you know, let's show them in scrapbook, so people get a sense of of the friendships and the camaraderie and the really the informality. Because what's happened to the group of seven over all these decades is that they've become canonized. And sometimes when you become a sacred cow, um, it means that people don't really look at your your work anymore because they think they know you. And so what we wanted to do with this book was really make people look again at the group of seven and look at them also you know, from different vantage points. So we wanted to get away from the vantage point of the group of seven, Canadian nationalism in the, the wake of the war and that they were claiming, you know, a new vision of Canada. Uh, we wanted to kind of break away from that and look at them back through the rear view mirror of history and say, what do contemporary people feel about the group of seven? How, how do they possess the imagination of Canadians still today? Why do they possess our imaginations today? And how different is that perspective if you're Gina Rory, a, you know, a, a female painter, or you're Bruce Coburn, a musician, or you're an Anishinaabe artist, Robert Houle from the Solo Nation, you know, in Winnipeg, or if you are, you know, John Hartman, who's an Ontario painter, or an Inuit woman, Tara Lick Duffy, the beat goes on. Like what we wanted to do with the book is kind of show the diverse ways in which people are responding to these legacies still. And our contention really at that Michael is that, of course, we have very rich holdings in the group of seven, um, but they have in some circles become less fashionable and in part because of um, discussions around their uh, visioning of Canada as a wilderness that was empty. And of course it was not, it was a very acculturated landscape that had been lived in by indigenous people, for example, for thousands of years. So there's ways in which we've come to feel about the group of seven that are really now are proving to be incre increasingly problematic. So we wanted to hear from all those voices in this book and bring them all together in a way that could allow us to experience those controversies and discussions without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. These are still extraordinary works of art and they speak of their times. And so what we want to do is go back to those times and understand them on their own terms, as well as look at them in hindsight and see what they might mean to us today. So we're going to hear from some of the um, uh, contributors to this book as we move into this evening. But first we want to hear from our indefatigable champion of the Group of Seven, Ian Desjardins, who is our executive director, who did Painting Canada back in Dulwich, uh, I guess almost a decade ago, which introduced um, the Group of Seven and Tom Thompson again to the British public. Of course, they'd been there, I suppose the last time was 1924, Ian, you, you could yeah. correct me. Yeah, 1925, in fact, yeah. 1925, but um, you know, Ian has moved to Canada to take up the post of leading the McMichael because of his 
passionate love of Canadian art, which is something that I very much share. And um, he's a wonderful writer, as you'll see when you when you get into this fantastic 8,000 word essay that he's written about the Group of Seven, which is really fresh and full of new insights. And I continue to be amazed by the way you put Canadian art together through a, through a new lens. It's a, it's a constant revelation. So thanks, Ian, and take it away. And let me know if I'm lingering over these slides for too long. Oh, no, well, then vice versa. Um, if I'm talking too much, just move on. I'll try and catch up with you, Sarah. That could be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I just like to to say, I mean, it, it, uh, my position in this, I'm deeply uh, honored to be um, in this position. I never expected to be executive director of the McMichael at this point in my career. My my uh, background is was firmly in old master paintings and I was a specialist, I suppose, if a specialist in anything in 17th century Dutch um, paintings. And, um, but at the same time, I was always organizing exhibitions. And I, the minute I laid eyes on, on uh, a book, actually, way back in the 1980s, of the group of seven works, I, I, you know, I winner when I see one in terms of an exhibition. And I remain to this day astonished that Painting Canada was effectively the first major exhibition in Britain. And not to mention in the Netherlands and uh, Norway, where it, where it toured afterwards, um, since the 1920s, um, it, it just never ceases to astonish me. And we did, it's history now, but we, we had cues down the path for this show. So I was right. I was right. I knew it was a winner. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, what I bring, I suppose, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to have had the, the chance to, to write this. I've, feel very honored to have the chance really and I suppose what I what I have is a kind of negative I don't have any baggage and I've discovered that you know Canadians you inevitably do an awful lot of people were brought up with the group of seven in dusty brown tinged reproductions on their schoolroom walls or or lining the corridors of a hospital it's not the best way of learning about them and I didn't see a group of seven painting until 2006. I was just electrified by the color and the vivacity of them um, and was, was just deeply moved by the whole thing. And I, and I still am. So it's been great to get to know them and I, I continue to get to know them. I, I write more, I think, as a, as a super fan than I can never be the kind of depth of scholar that you know someone who's been brought up with the group of seven can be. But I hope I, I can bring a kind of different, fresh perspective on it. I love this page because I was so pleased we were able to reproduce the whole of that essay. This at the top of the page here is Lauren Harris's essay. A bit less than 8,000 words, I would say. <laughs> Somewhat um, more succinct. <laughs> um, those were the days, 1920. This was, <laughs> but this was the opening of the exhibition on May the 7th in 1920 and this was the tiny little catalogue with a little logo designed by Franklin Carmichael on, on the top there. And I, I've always found this essay, uh, frankly, screamingly funny, but it, it's significantly screamingly funny. And the, right, the, the reason I'm amused by it is because it's just so defensive. Um, it, it really is. I can read a, a few little um, snippets out of it. If I've got the right specs on, hang on. Here you go. Um, he talks about, it seems inevitable when uh, something vital and distinctive arises, it will be met by one, ridicule, abuse or indifference, he says. Then he goes on to talk about the so-called art lovers um, preferring to enrich the salesman, blah, blah, blah. The more sophisticated, the more sophisticated um, will say anything that sounds erudite, patting their own backs at the expense of art and country. And uh, it goes on. Basically, uh, he takes the trouble to, base, to insult every conceivable possible visitor to the exhibition and ends with um, a word as you view the pictures. The artists invite adverse, adverse criticism. Indifference is the greatest evil they have to contend with. They should be so lucky. I should imagine most people have walked out of the exhibition immediately, having been insulted in every possible way. This is, not, this is not someone concerned with branding. 
I think is the issue here. But it's also significant because um, it's very important that the Group of Seven were founded in an atmosphere of reactionary criticism. They had got through the, the 10 years before with all sorts of abuse being hurled at them even before they set up the group. This was the, the wonderful period Hector Charlesworth referring to the, the mild mannered Jim McDonald's paintings as a Hungarian goulash or the contents of a drunkard's stomach. It's one of my favorites ever. <laughs> Um, you know, and you kind of look at the paintings today and say, what? Why? What were they looking at? But the fact is, it was a very reactionary art establishment at that day. And people didn't hold back. It's quite encouraging, really. I've always thought that Twitter was the rudest place on the planet, but actually the 1920s <laughs> were just as bad. Um, so reactionary world they lived in. They knew they would receive brickbats. And the wonderful thing about insult and group insult is that it, it creates solidarity. And the, you know, that's what the Group of Seven is all about, really. I love these images here. One of the great strengths of the book, I think, is the use of these old photographs. Um, we have a wonderful archive and just to dig out and find that wonderful picture on the left of Arthur Lismer clearly shivering, looking extremely uncomfortable out <laughs> in the open air with Tom Thompson. Um, there are also photos of him sort of crouching in the bottom of a canoe with a, with a puppy hanging on for dear life, while Tom rode him out uh, in a manly fanner, manner. Um, Lismer and Varley, of course, were from, from Yorkshire. More than that, they were from Sheffield. I mean, God help them. The, the great Canadian wilderness was, must have been a shock and cold and uncomfortable, and there were bugs. Next to it is one of the, one of the great joys of our collection. And this was our discovery about Lismer. I'm learning more about him all, every, all the time. Lismer is a great cartoonist. He, he, he drew um, these little cartoons all the time. He went around with a sketchbook. He was a wonderful draftsman, both in a traditional fine art sense, but also um, in, in these cartoons, which I think he, he was mimicking the cartoons that you find in Punch magazine. And there's a famous photo in 1911 holding the coronation of Punch magazine, George V. Uh, look at this. This is can only be Lauren Harris. You can always tell Lauren Harris because of the hair. Um, in 1920, Harris was rather debonair and had uncontrolled hair. I think he let it grow and it turned white. And I think it's his little rebellion against the art establishment. And his hair is, is quite something, it's actually electrifying. And it meant that Lismer could always identify him by this kind of cumulus cloud of white hair. But here, Lauren Harris, um, the spiritual um, man, and Lismer was too, they both joined the Theosophy Society in, in 1924, sitting on top of a mountain overlooking Lake, um, Lake Superior, conducting the cosmos. Um, and off to the side there is Lismer desperately trying to conduct the cosmos as well with his hat blowing off. Um, it, I love this particularly because the view there, there in front of there, we've actually got the painting that Lauren Harris painted of that island in the distance. So this has a double, a double resonance for us. I think we could move on. And another one, uh, Lismer is recording a, a, a sketching trip and it does remind us, um, th these, these sketches by Lismer remind us of that extraordinary element of roughing it in, in the outdoors, which was so much part of the the project, the Group of Seven project. These days, it again, it slightly makes me laugh. It's all so manly um, that it's a bit a little tiresome, really. But you do have to bear in mind that um, in those days, you know, words like virile and red-blooded were regularly used um, to describe art that you particularly liked. You know, in other words, if, if, if art you thought was particularly strong, you always described it as virile which must have been extremely irritating to the likes of Yvonne McCabe Hauser, who was every bit as strong-minded as any of the Group of Seven. I hope, they, I hope her works weren't described as virile. But anyway, here is, again, Lauren Harris, apparently chopping down a tree. Um, it's the punchline to a joke we don't know, um, but the line underneath is, oh, woodman, spare that there tree, presumably spoken in broad Yorkshire by Lismer on, on the side there with his ever-present um, pipe Hi. in his mouth. Trees loom large in, in, uh, in Lauren Harris's life. And this sort of thing, this is a kind of 
fantastic um, redeeming feature of Lismore's drawings. We, we, we illustrated the extraordinary chronology at the back. I should say the chronology is a tremendous work of scholarship by Greg Kamenyuk, who really brought together. I, what I asked him to do was to, to really record the, the history of exhibitions because the, the Group of Seven weren't just about their eight Group of Seven shows. They uh, either arranged or contributed to dozens, dozens, dozens of shows that toured the US, uh, in England, as we know, and elsewhere. They, they really did their bit. They, they got out there. And that was really why the Group of Seven were founded. It was an exhibition broking group. But if we didn't have a drawing like this, the only um, photograph we seem to have um, of Frank Johnston is that awful thing where he's, he looks like the, the grumpiest bank manager in the West. And it, it, it's really unfortunate. But here he is, hand on hip, pigeon toed, um, paintbrush in hand, um, floppy tie, and a, tr a truly hipster hairstyle. It, it's a great, it's a great thing to have. Otherwise, you might make all sorts of wrong assumptions about Frank Johnston. Next, whoops, you forgive me for this uh, problem I'm having with my cursor, but we will just welly on. Okay. No, well, what a lovely one to look at. This is um, being in Georgian Bay. One of um, the McMichael's five kind of larger scale Tom Thompson's. He's particularly famous for the 600 odd um, small sketches. And indeed, Sarah and I are working on, on a show that we intend to conquer the world in due course um, of Tom Thompson's sketches largely with, with not so many of the large paintings in. Because I think Tom Thompson's sketches are the real genius of Canadian art. I mean, I, I, I'm awestruck every time I see them. But this one is one of his larger scale paintings and it's very beautiful. But it's also intriguing to me because he's painting like a post-impressionist. Effectively, the style of his technique there is derived ultimately from Seurat, Georges Seurat. Now, Tom Thompson never left North America. As far, the furthest he got was Seattle. I don't know how many Seurat's he might have seen in Seattle, but I strongly suspect none. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he can ever have laid eyes on a Van Gogh, as I'm sorry, I always call him. I know I should call him Van Gogh, but I can't, just can't do it. He never laid eyes on post-impressionist work, and yet he paints like a post-impressionist. How? Because he's talking to Jackson and Harris. That's how. Jackson, Harris, Liz Mavali, all of them had, had really sophisticated, sophisticated, sophisticated backgrounds in academic art training. They had studied abroad. They, they were thoroughly um, imbued in academic training and they had seen this work. The, the chat between these artists, you have to imagine it, but you can see it in Tom Thompson's work because where else was he getting these ideas? Next, I, I, you know, I particularly asked to see these because it's one of the miracles of Canadian art. Again, I think the within the group of seven, this because they use these small iPad-sized sketches um, in the wild. I mean, if you're if you're um, trekking across wild and on trackless wastes and uh, climbing mountains and canoeing and portaging and all the rest of it, you cannot carry, uh, you know an easel or a large um, uh, canvas, they all worked on these small panels, which they could carry in a lightweight box. It was portable. And this is a pragmatic accident that has led to one of the great glories of Canadian art. And then what you see with all of the group of seven in, and, in, and Tom Thompson leading the way is this fascinating process of translation between these small sketches done quickly out on plein air and then when they get back, Thompson would come back and work in the shack, freezing to death over the winter, transcribing some of those sketches into large paintings. Here's a, here's a really beautiful early example. The sketch is an utter masterpiece. Um, it is extraordinary light filled. It breathes fresh air. It's cold. It, it gives you a chill looking at it. And then you see him translating it very carefully into what I think of as a kind of arts and crafts masterpiece. It reminds me of, if anything, of Quebec Impressionism. 
And to see how all of these artists translate their original ideas into the finished painting is one of the most fascinating things, I think. Next. Mm. Oh, <laughs> sorry, what can you say? Um, on the left, you have to, uh, one of Tom Thompson's, men, well, uh, about how many, six or seven mm -hmm. uh, sketches of the Petawawa Gorges that he made his way to by canoe. And they are, in many ways, they're kind of Tom Thompson's equivalent of Monet's haystacks mm -hmm. or Rouen Cathedral. Um, he, he deliberately paints more or less the same view and does it in different light. And one of, the, one of the things that I find so fascinating about Tom Thompson is that you can feel the exaltation he feels in trying out this technique. He moved from being a rather staid Sunday painter in 1912 to painting things like this in 1915 and 1916, where he uses absolute undiluted color to establish tone and atmosphere and temperature and sense of space. It's a remarkable transformation. I mean, the man was a genius. And it, interestingly, in the Petawawa Gorges, you have him exulting in that technique and using it to really record minute changes in, in the, the, the view and the atmosphere. And of course, there's his wonderful famous tent. Isn't that glorious? Next, I can't say anything about that, it's too wonderful. <laughs> and we love these. I, well, I, I just think they're very beautiful. At first, I have to admit, when I first came to Canada, I was mystified by these. Because on the one hand, they're extremely decorative in terms of their color and this very interesting use of black as the backdrop, mm -hmm. which intensifies the color. And the more you look at it, the less sort of <laughs> contrived decoration they are. They're so broad in their handling. They're so bold. I mean, basically, the one on the left is just a pile of wildflowers. Um, he hasn't kind of arranged them. There's no sense. I'm used to 17th century Dutch um, flower paintings where everything is arranged to the, the nth degree. Thompson has just piled them up on a black surface and painted them. They are extraordinary painterly essays. The more I look at them, the more I love them. And the one on the right is almost very, it's very close to abstraction. Onwards. Mm -hmm. Oh. Nope. And on to Jackson. Um, Jackson was probably the most highly trained of all the artists. He had spent a lot of the years of the early 1900s in France, and he traveled to Italy and England. Um, he studied broadly and he, by 1912, 1913, he was painting like a very sophisticated French impressionist with a hint of realism. It's kind of impressionist realism to it, a very sophisticated painter indeed. And his kind of induction into the group of seven was really a piece of headhunting by MacDonald and Harris. And he also crucially was persuaded to stay in Canada by MacDonald and Harris and he moved to Toronto. He was based in Montreal before that. And um, in 1914, he and Thompson were both subsidized by Dr. McCallum, an early supporter. So they could spend a year for different reasons. Um, in Tom Thompson's case, McCallum was trying to wean him away from thinking of himself as a Sunday painter. In Jackson's case, it was really to try and persuade him to stay in Canada because he was planning to go to the States. What happened in 1914 though was, was very um, important. Um, they, they shared a studio together. Thompson and Jackson moved into the studio building in Rosedale the early part of that year, then went their separate ways, but met up in Algonquin Park towards the end of the summer. And by the end of that summer, Jackson, as he put it, didn't know whether he was following or leading because Thompson had kind of effected a miracle in the meantime. It was obviously thought that Jackson would be teaching Thompson. By the end of that year, it was really the other way around. And that's how Jackson really becomes a sort of group of seven member. It's, it's I think, dealing with, with the influence of Thompson and eventually, of course, coping with the grief at his loss. 
uh, and you see these wonderful sketches. Uh, Jackson is another one of the great Canadian oil sketchers. Marvelous paintings. Mm -hmm. Next. All right. Oops. <laughs> That's all right. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to come up. <laughs> well, both of these are small paintings. They're tiny paintings. And they're, they're, they're testimony to a, his own version. Of, I, I hesitate to say pot and boilers, but Jackson, um, having been part of the, the membership of the Group of Seven, he developed his own line because he went back to Quebec uh, in the winter. And he was, he, he loved the rural landscape of Quebec and he went back in the winter. So he was known as Père Raquette. You know, he, he was out in his snowshoes recording what he thought was being lost. He was concerned about the loss of the vernacular architecture of Quebec, the farms, the churches, the little villages. And he found his own little line of painting that actually turned into a bit of a moneymaker for him um, he, he did many, many snow scenes of, of Quebec in winter, and he really had landed um, a unique strain, I think, in the group of seven. He gets very close to Clarence Gagnon, I think, in his, his capture of the light, this sort of dazzling uh, reflected light of the snow. Um, that painting on the left with the church is one of my favorite by Jackson. He uses color in such a sophisticated way, but it's really about the light and, and the brushwork. Wonderful. Next. Ah, uh -huh. Lauren Harris. <laughs> now, of course, we're, Lauren Harris was really the driving force behind the group. I mean, I think um, he even went so far as to build the studio building, in, uh, which opened in 1914, which was clearly intended to be an architectural hub for, for the group of seven. That was where the group was supposed to be. And I think Lauren Harris really was expecting a group of some kind to be formed, a formal grouping to be formed in 1914. But of course, we all know what happened. Um, the war was declared um, later in the year. And of course, Jackson uh, went back to Quebec and eventually enlisted and everything went wrong at that point. And so it was postponed for six years. And a lot happened in those six years. But Harris um, was involved in the war as well. He was a firearms instructor in the war. And he lost his brother in um, 1918. His brother Howard was killed um, while inspecting German trenches. And in 1917, of course, Tom Thompson tragically drowned. And the the overall impact of this was he had he effectively had a nervous breakdown and he turned increasingly um, to spirituality in his art. And this was the great period of the flourishing of, theosoph of theosophy uh, across the cultural sector, actually. Um, you know, in ballet and opera, um, you find the theosophy looming large. To us, it looks a bit, well, to me, I, you know, I'm ignorant about theosophy to, to the nth degree. But it does look a bit like a sort of happy, clappy version of Haight Ashbury in the 1960s. Um, they were they were hippies. But what he's looking for in these images, notice all those parallel lines. He he clarifies the images. He he, he gives them strong outlines. He gives them strong form. It's as if he's discovered that God is actually an Art Deco sculptor, and he's he's recording the divine in the landscape and imposing order on it. This is, this is his spirituality coming through. Blue was significant and you can always see um, Lauren Harris, these, these images, he uses blue and you often have that yellow light at the top. Yellow was also significant in terms of um, it, it suggested um, divinity. Now, he, because he was looking for structure and form in this very spiritual way, Lauren Harris, Harris is all about form. In other words, looking at a tree, he, he really wasn't very interested in leaves. He, you know, leaves were too much detail for him. Jackson records that he, Harris wanted to move on from Algoma because there was actually just too much detail. It was, it was, it was, it was too lush. 
he wanted something more bare, more stark, where he could see the hand of God at work, if you like. And on the North Shore of Lake Superior, he found it. And he found it again, almost by accident. I mean, Lake Superior would, would kind of instill images of the divine in anybody. I've been there and it's, a, it's completely awesome. But as an extra benefit, wildfire had swept through the North um, a year or more. And so what he found was these wonderful trees. He calls these sentinels mm -hmm. where all the detail is gone and you really have these extraordinary shapes reaching up into the sky like praying hands. They're, they're very, very strong. And I cannot help thinking also, incidentally, sorry, Sarah, you're probably itching to turn no, no. the But I cannot help thinking that he's thinking about the battlefields of Flanders. This, this image of dead trees was a universal one at this point. It was one of the defining images of the First World War. Um, photographs came back, postcards came back of this utterly ruined landscape with these shattered trees. And artists like Paul Nash, for instance, and indeed Fred Varley as a, as a war artist recorded that as one of the defining images of the war. I find it hard to believe that Lauren Harris isn't somehow making reference to that idea. Next, ah, snow fantasy. This is significant because um, it's a very particular moment. It's often dated around 1917, but it could be 1916, I think. The first sketch, which belongs to the AGO, is usually dated 1915. And it's fascinating to me because it, there are two influences coming to play here. One is the post-impressionist influence that I mentioned earlier with Tom Thompson effectively going back to Seurat and his school. And you see that in the way he's painted the snow in, on, the, on the ground below. The idea of this image, the, the snow-laden trees, is definitely coming from Scandinavian art. In 1913, um, Harris and MacDonald visited Buffalo to see the Scandinavian Contemporary Art Exhibition. And they were blown away by it because they found a group of painters from a northern landscape who had put together a language to record their landscape that was unique to Scandinavia. It was a powerful incentive to do the same for Canada. And that's what they said. We, we now need to do the same for Canada. And at first, Harris uses that influence and um, produces effectively a kind of Scandinavian vision of Canada. Next. Oh. Franklin Carmichael. I do so love Franklin Carmichael. I don't know why. It's completely irrational, but he is basically my favorite. It's a guilty secret. Um, but what do I love about these paintings? Um, I love the panorama feel about it. And actually, I, I particularly enjoy, he was a great commercial artist, Franklin Carmichael, a, a glorious draftsman, wonderful printmaker, so there's a precision to his landscapes, the way he uses stripes and strips and striations of color to build a sense of distance, while also creating a decorative pattern on the surface of the painting. And the way that he can create a sparkle on distant water, mm -hmm. he's unchallenged actually at doing that. I think it's, it's one of his greatest skills. He also loved skies and he, he turned them into kind of geometric mosaics the one on the right, I, I, I've often apologized to, um, to Sarah about this because I give her such a hard time about projecting onto paintings. Um, <laughs> she has a very active imagination. I have to tick her off all the time. But in this painting, I, I'm sorry, but if those clouds don't form a great flying eagle, I don't know what. Maybe I'm projecting as well. Anyway, I, that's what I think and I'm sticking to it. I think it's contagious. Yeah, I know, it's, it's awful, I never, <laughs> never hold my head up again. Okay, MacDonald. And MacDonald, I think, comes a very close second to Thompson in the Canadian oil sketch um, lists. He was remarkable like this, and I think he learned a lot from Thompson. Um, MacDonald was the oldest of the group of seven by some way, actually. 
he was already 47 when they when they um, uh, were founded in 1920. And he was a father figure to them all. He had been literally their leader, most of them, at Grip Limited. He was the artistic director there when, they, when most of them, apart from Harris and Jackson, actually worked as commercial artists. So he was very definitely the father figure and mentor for the group. And he was particularly close to Thompson. And I think he was devastated by Thompson's death. But the interesting thing was that in the aftermath of Thompson's death, Harris and MacDonald took on the task of basically cataloging the 300 sketches that Thompson left in the shack in Rosedale. And that engagement, I think, would only have happened because of Thompson's death. And I think that kind of intense um, application of dealing with Thompson's output had a profound transformative effect on Donald's work. And you see that immediately in the Algoma paintings, particularly in the first, first instance between 1918 and 1921, where he's definitely working through Thompson's influence. But then he discovers in 1924 the Rockies and thereafter he always goes there every summer, often joined by Harris. And he develops his own style in the rock is far more interested in flat planes of color, very interested in um, expressive brushwork. And he almost gets rid of sky so that these paintings come very, very close to abstraction, I think. These are two very fine examples of his Rocky's work next. And then a reminder on the right, I find this particularly interesting. I mean, this is early, um, before the foundation of the Group of Seven, and MacDonald um, left GRIP to become a professional artist in 1911. And he works his way through various different styles in that period. He, he, you know, he tries on kind of English rural style. And the one on the right reminds me of nothing so much as Emil Nolder, the, the Belgian painter. This is as close as MacDonald certainly gets. And indeed, most of the Group of Seven never flirt with expressionism particularly, but he's very close to expressionist um, use of color there, I think. It's a, it's a gorgeous painting. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the left, um, the, the, the Northern Lights. Uh, this was something that both he and uh, Thompson were extremely interested in capturing something that was considered to be impossible to paint. Not only Northern Lights, but you'll notice the Big Dipper there. For some reason, MacDonald always puts the Big Dipper in when he's painting Northern Lights. Anyway, next. Johnson. Johnston is the great mystery man. He only lasted about 20 minutes. He, he, he exhibited with the, the first exhibition of the Group of Seven in uh, 1920. And then uh, effectively, he didn't actually resign until 1924, but he went off to Winnipeg the next year to, to become the principal of the School of Art there. And it's generally felt that he left because he felt that he could do better on his own. He didn't like being tarred with the brush of the young rebel um, that, you know, the group of seven had to put up with all of the abuse from Hector Charlesworth and his ilk. Um, Johnston really did quite well on his own. He was very prolific. But there is this moment in 1918, <clears throat> thereabouts, when Johnston is joining with MacDonald and Harris and later Jackson um, on their trips up into Algoma. And at that moment, Johnston paints as close to the general idea of the group of seven as he was ever to get. He diverges quite quickly, as early as I would say as 1921. The interesting thing on the right um, there is that this painting is um, assumed because of its technique to be an Algo Algoma painting from around 1918. But if you could, I doubt if you could see it, but the, the, the signature at the bottom left is Franz, Franz Johnston. He changed his name by deep pull to Franz, I think in 1927, 1928. Um, so there's a mystery here. Is this a later painting in the style of his Algoma work? Or is it an Algoma work that he only got around to signing later in the 20s? There's a mystery for someone to solve. Next, not me. Casson. 
Kassen is often underestimated, I think. And it's partly because he was so much younger than the rest of the group. He lived right until 1992. It's astonishing. Uh, I could have met him. Um, but it, it, he was a late comer. He joined the group in 1926, uh, really to fill the gap left by Johnston. He had been um, a colleague of Frank Carmichael's and was a dear friend of Frank Carmichael's all the rest of Carmichael's life and indeed was his assistant at Routes and Mann and then Samson and Matthews. And he had a long career as a commercial artist and was, was a brilliant commercial artist. He did wonderful work. And I think very often he's dismissed as being too descriptive, too illustrative, too um, graphic, uh, too much of a commercial artist. But look at these things, they're austere and they're beautiful and they're cool um, in their color and tone. And I think they are truly lovely. All of the group had their own signature way of painting trees. Uh, it's, it's one of the ways you can distinguish them. But I particularly love Cassens. If you look at the trees in the distance of the painting on the right there, he paints them as feathers, just individual feathers stuck down in the landscape. It's a, it's a beautiful conceit. I think he's a wonderful artist. Next. I'm going to race you through this next one because it's not your favorite. No, next. <laughs> On to the naked ladies. Okay, Holgate. <laughs> Holgate joined in 1929. And you can see why he was, he was a, a very well-established Montreal artist. And I think the group of seven were all begin, already beginning to look further afield. They began to feel that they were too insular, too Ontario based. Um, and so Holgate, who was an established and well-known artist across the country, actually had a national reputation, was a natural person to invite. His landscapes, um, not, these, not this one particularly on the left, but his landscapes often have a lot in common with uh, the group of sevens, but they're more diffuse. They have a particular color sensibility to them, which sets him apart, but he's a wonderful landscapist. He alone, I think, amongst the group um, was also a figure painter, uh, not in the sense of being a portraitist like Varley, but as, as a pure figures in the landscape. And he developed a line of, of kind of sculptural nudes in the landscape, um, which was all his own and they're very beautifully composed. Mm -hmm. This is a lovely one, actually. Positively Michelangelesque. Mm -hmm. There's one of his landscapes on the left that could, I suppose, at a distance be, be mistaken for a, um, one of the other group of sevens. But the, no, it's still quite, quite um, individual and uh, distinctive. Um, a lovely artist. And this wonderful flower piece on the right um, Jackson did a few flower pieces as well, mostly before um, the, before 1920. But Holgate, um, you know, was very, very various. He could do um, uh, flower pieces. He was a wonderful portraitist. He was a wonderful landscapist. And in fact, at the Montreal School of Art, he 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 taught um, wood engraving. Uh, so he was a specialist in 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 woodcuts as well. Next, oh. I'm finished. Just getting into <laughs> Just get it going. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, thank you so much. We're just going to pause for a second here. Um, just to remind you that um, wonderful books and wonderful exhibitions and wonderful museums don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in an environment of resource and enthusiasm and solidarity with donors. So if you're enjoying yourself and, uh, and please do come and see us, we are actually still open Thursday to Sunday uh, up in Vaughan it, in Kleinberg. Um, and hopefully if we keep our fingers and toes crossed, we, that might continue to be the case for a while. But in the meantime, we're wanting to bring you as much digital content and great experiences as we possibly can online, like so many of our colleagues are doing. And uh, don't hold back should you feel the driving urge to um, reach for your phone and grab that QR code because uh, like every other museum and business these days, um, we are looking to our friends to get us through dark times. So that being said, um, Ian, thank you so, so much for amusing us all as you always do. It is just so great to hear you talk about the group. I love it every time at Tom Thompson too. Um, I want to just turn us to to talk a little bit about the artists ind individually, um, some of them at least in the in the second part of this evening, 
Um, each, uh, once, we, once we've moved through Ian's uh, introductory essay in the book, the book then proceeds artist by artist. And here's a beautiful um, spread that introduces Fred Varley and you see uh, a beautiful close up of the Night Fairy Vancouver, which is one of Varley's real masterpieces that we're lucky to have at the Met Michael. Again, it's, it's sort of astonishing. And I think one has to remind oneself that all these paintings we're looking at are in our collection. And it really is, you know, this book is about our holdings at McMichael and it really is, you know, a testimonial to how well Bob and Sydney collected and then the kind of, um, uh, the kind of uh, passion that they instilled in other art collectors. And of course, there's also um, very worrying uh, tales of um, Robert McMichael going to funerals and trying to shake down the aunties and uncles. <laughs> about any paintings that might be hanging around that needed a new home. He, I feel as, like he was a certain, you know, certain way a kind of kindred spirit to us because he was very, very passionate about Canadian art, but he made wonderful choices and were so much the beneficiaries of that. So um, one of the wonderful writers that we worked with in this book is Jennifer Beishwald, who is, is here with us. You can see her smiling there. Um, she said she didn't want to be, what was it? The um, the sage on the stage, she wanted me to just simply have a conversation with her about her um, encounter with um, this picture by Varley, which she chose to write about and, and her own connection as a person who, who has a different kind of entree to the group of seven than many people do. And Jennifer, thank you for being with us tonight. And will you tell me about Dead Tree Garibaldi Park and what drew you to it? Okay. Um... I was, I was just amazed by that talk, Ian, and it, when, when you said that you were not of it, so you didn't, you didn't grow up steeped in it and it brought you a different perspective, that really resonated with me because when Sarah first asked me to write this, I immediately thought of my husband, Nick, who is an eighth generation Canadian and, you know, settler culture, very much so, and he there is a continuity for him with identity and place and the group of seven interpretation of place and landscape that is quite unshakable and, and very deeply rooted. And so my thought was, why aren't you asking him to do it? it this is way more <laughs> his world than mine. And yet, um, when I thought about it, that was very much, you know, I'm a first generation Canadian and I didn't even see those paintings, the, the reproductions of those paintings when I was walking through the hallways of my high school. I didn't think they were for me. I didn't think they were addressed to me in any way. So I just kind of ignored them. And uh, it wasn't until my father's from India, was from India, he died in 1995. And there was an element a, a sort of a quality of the exotic to this landscape, certainly, and also the way that it was um, interpreted in these group of seven paintings for him. And uh, when we were young, and the essay sort of talks about this, he would take us around, you know, for some reason, my mother was never there. I think <laughs> she was a break from, from the four children, but he would take us off on these you know, sort of expeditions to Banff and uh, and to Garibaldi uh, Park. And we would sort of go out, we would be hiking, we would be, you know, in these, these worlds that were so um, not of his experience. He grew up in South India in a tiny village and then, you know, became a, a heart surgeon and, and moved to Canada. And, and so, for me, there is something about the, the merging of this interpretation that I see, especially in this painting, because of course, being from BC, and even though I've lived in Ontario now for 30 years, I still think of this as what nature really is. Nature is British Columbia, it's mm. not Ontario. Um, and and I, I, I just can't get away from that um, because it was so imprinted on me in those early, you know, hikes with my father as our guide. And, and, and of course, the, the illusion of the pristine. I mean, even then um, we, we were, BC was a 
booming resource culture as most of Canada is, the logging, the, you know, basically the pillaging of old growth that continues today was very much happening then. And yet, you know, you had this illusion of wilderness where you would go along the highways and they would keep the stand of trees by the road so that you wouldn't know that there was a clear cut behind it. Um, and then you'd go into these very carefully marked parks with the paths and the maps and the boundaries and, and they were our experience, but I really did believe that I was in the wild. I believe that I was perhaps the first person who ever touched this tree or, you know, would go off the path for a few minutes just to pretend I was, you know, alone in the forest. And, uh, you know, with then my family calling me in, in five minutes wondering where the hell I'd got to. But I, I, I had this, this, this spiritual communion with place that I now find in these paintings. They've kind of come together for me. Uh, so I do own it. You know, Jennifer, while you're talking, I'm thinking of all these extraordinary films that you've made about the, the power and the, the, the natural world. And it's, you know, I hadn't really put this together when I actually asked you to, to write this essay, but you know, so much of the work that you've done in film has been around the, the natural world that you obviously experienced in a super intense way as a child. Right, or, or the, the, the human, um, uh, especially in our work with Ed Bertinsky, mm -hmm. um, human imprint on that, on that mm -hmm. natural world and the, you know, the, the interpretation of that world as resource essentially and what that really meant. And I find it fascinating that you know, in the group, all of these paintings were very much, you know, you don't see the logging mill that's just off to the left or that, you know, the, you're, you're just looking at what you think is this, this untouched place. And as you mentioned, of course, there were, there were people here long before mm -hmm. um, uh, these settlers ever came. But I, I think for me, the, 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 the most powerful thing when we took, the, the essay is about taking my father's ashes uh, to India after he died and trying to basically find a, a place to take him. We were going to uh, immerse him in the Ganges River and everywhere we went to try to do that, it didn't feel right somehow to us. Mm -hmm. We were in Varanasi and it was so crowded and the power of that place is, is absolutely undeniable. But the, the holiness of that place has nothing to do with a, 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 an interpretation of, um, I don't know, not, not so much ceremony, but, but um, majesty. It is about, it, it, it was ever thus, right? As long as somebody is, is, is reciting the, the text correctly, it's being done the right way. You don't have to have an attitude of, of reverence towards it for it to be true. Mm -hmm. And so we kept going on and on and on. And in the end, where we, we ended up releasing the ashes it was it as somebody pointed out to me it was a place that looked exactly like British Columbia we found the only place in India where there were no other people mm -hmm. and where we were essentially in the mountains in the Rocky Mountains with a beautiful pristine river coming off of the glacier and um, I had so realized that I had no idea that that's what we were all looking for as the perfect spiritual place, the place that made the most sense to, to let him go. Yeah, so it's just a very complicated story about going home or trying to figure out what home means to in relation to landscape, you know? But yes, and also the, the idea of, of, of identity and place. When you come from two immigrant, you know, my mother was British and so they clashed, <laughs> their families clashed. You don't feel a sense of collective, um, a, yeah. sort of a, a belonging in that way. And I've learned over the years as a filmmaker that actually that helps me in my perspective because I can kind of find a way in anywhere. I can illuminate from the margins. I'm always looking to the margins to see what the margins are, how they're, they're, they're reflecting on the center. And I would have done that if I had that continuity of self and identity and a very strong belief in my own place, but mm -hmm. I have it now. Um, and, and, and in a large part, I have it not just through my direct experience of landscape, but my 
experience of the way that the group of seven have um, brought it to me. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. We were so lucky to have you in this book and your essay is so beautiful. Um, thank you, Jennifer. I want to turn now to Gerald McMaster, who wrote this beautiful essay for me about Lemoyne Fitzgerald. And um, Gerald uh, is a very esteemed um, professor at, at OCAD U, Canada Research Chair, a curator, artist, um, author, professor of Indigenous visual culture and aesthetics. Um, Gerald and I had a conversation, I don't know, Gerald, if you remember, many, many years ago when I was talking to him about my sense of place in BC and how the element that one thinks of in BC is the deep dark forests. And it was just around the time that I'd been working with Ian on our exhibition on Emily Carr, which we did at Dulwich and which traveled back to the AGO. But I asked Gerald, whose people come from the prairie, um, what is the element that makes you feel that you're home? What is the element of the prairie? And he said, without pausing to think about it for a moment, he said, the wind. And so when I, I've been thinking about that comment of his and thinking what a beautiful premise it would actually be for an exhibition someday uh, about the cultures of the prairie, but um, because so much comes from that and, and Gerald's helped me to understand that. But this Fitzgerald painting is, is such a masterpiece of evoking the wind moving through the sky. And Gerald, thank you so much for for this beautiful essay. Can, and can you talk to me a little bit about this painting and what happens for you when you look at it? Uh, hi, Sarah, thank you. You bet. I, um, we have a wonderful I, uh, metaphor in it I have to share. Sorry, then I'll be quiet. Yes. Okay, go ahead. You make go ahead. like a big, you make, you say, you describe it as like being a big shaggy beast that's walking <laughs> forward to the landscape. And when I read that, I was just like, okay, my mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was, as I was listening to Jennifer and about her, uh, uh, where she comes from in BC and going back to India and, uh, and then living in Ontario, I was thinking the same thing of my trajectory as well. And I remember, as you say, I, I come from the prairies, uh, Saskatchewan. In 1981, I traveled to Ontario. It was, I came to Ontario to work actually. I had a job in Ottawa. So I was just this young person right out of the prairies. I remember driving through the prairies and, and all of a sudden, you know, you enter into, you go through past Winnipeg and all of a sudden it's like the world shuts, shuts off, you know? <laughs> so it, it was the trees. It was, it, I was, I was meeting the trees for the first time. Not that there aren't any trees in the prairies, but there are hardly any trees on the prairies. Yeah. But when you when you reach the woodlands, you it's like a curtain just closes on you. So you know you I had to stop and put some tobacco on the ground just to say I'm I'm leaving my home and entering somewhere else, you know. And uh, lo and behold, I've been living in the east since 1981, and uh, occasionally go back, occasionally once or twice a year go back to the prairies. And yeah, it's the first thing you recognize when you either, when you drive back, you get off the plane and all of a sudden it just hits you like, like this, you know, the, the wind just bam, it hits you. And you're, you're, you're standing at this degree, not straight up and down like you are here, but you're, at, you're sort of leaning into the wind just to get your balance once again. So that's the way I feel when I go back. But um, you're right. I think one of the things that I was thinking about when, I, when you asked me to do a work and uh, particularly this one of Fitzgerald and, and where he was from, we found out he was you know, from Winnipeg, uh, born and raised kind of in Southern, Southern Manitoba. So it was kind of that prairie region and looking at this painting kind of reminded me of the, you know, the, the space that he was thinking about. It's so unlike you know, what Ian was talking about and all the other painters that we've come to know very, very well who are painting Northern Ontario. Here you have this particular work that uh, it's just this, uh, this, uh, these two trees that are standing there. But I was thinking, you know, about about the making this distinctions because in the essay I say I come from a culture that's very different, and uh, and how they see the land is so vastly different. And Ian so wonderfully describes the these painters who are going out into 
the landscape and painting locations, you know, because, you know, if you read their titles, it is about locations, you know, that's Algoma or it's Algonquin Park or somewhere like that. So, but I found that indigenous people see it quite differently. You know, they don't see it as location. They see this location, yes, but they see the land in terms of story. They see the land in terms of history because something happened there. And so you, how do you embody that? How do you embody this magnificent creation that is all around you? And it's so difficult. And so you see the artists with uh, try to use material. You know, here the group of seven painters are using paint on a surface. Contrast that with the artists, uh, Anishinaabe artists, for example, who are embodying the land with using material, the flora and the fauna in, in such delicate ways, as much like the painters are handling paint in delicate ways. They're both looking at the same space, but articulating it in vastly different ways. And I think that that's what drew me to think about the painters and to think, okay, now how can I look at this, look at this space, the space that Fitzgerald is providing me to look at and to, to just wonder about. And, and I think that that's where I came across this idea when you asked me to, to, to talk about it a bit more, talk about the wind and how does that, that element, you know, there's such a strong element when you go to the prairies, how does it, how do we impact it? How do you even describe it? Well, it's described in so many different ways, you know, you, you couldn't even describe it in paint. And I think Fitzgerald does a valiant job here. Of just, yeah you know, this kind of expressionistic movement of paint uh, uh, and just easy, you know, applied in a very easy mannered way, not a mannered way, but a, a, a spontaneous way. And, and that's what I liked about this because it, it begins to kind of sense, just like when I describe about how do you see wind? How do you articulate wind? Well, the birds do that, right? You see the birds fly or you see the grasses moving so the trees, similarly, that's the only sense we get of the wind. Otherwise, you know, if you're blind, then you get to feel it in a very, very different way and can articulate it. Mm -hmm. Here we're seeing it. We're trying to we're trying to describe it through our sense of looking and visualizing, but it can be sensed in so many other different ways. And that's what I was trying to get at. And I'm thinking about how did uh, how did uh, uh, artists in the past. Uh, predating the group. How would they have articulated that in so many different ways? Well, they did it in so many different ways that uh, I described a bit in the in my short essay. Mm -hmm. But I think that that was to me that what was the driving sense is to is to try to describe wind. And as I say, I described wind. And I and I, I might have said I can't remember what I said in the essay, but much like Inuit have when we yeah. think of Inuit and they talk about snow and everybody says, oh, they have 20 words for snow or 30 words or 40 words. Similarly with my people, we have so many words for wind, right? Yeah, and you it share describes, some of mm -hmm. It describes the wind in so many different ways. And I think that that was the thing to think about in terms of an aesthetic of the prairies. What is it that describes it? And I think looking at Fitzgerald allowed me to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you can see him really struggling to describe something that is in fact invisible. But I think, you know, as you say, but I think he brings a great feeling of spirit to it. And it just, I was really curious to see, you know, your response to that quality in this painting, because he's coming from such a completely different perspective on the landscape than you are, as someone who, who grew up in a very different way in that environment. Yes, I, um, I was thinking as well, that some, and, and this one in particular, unlike, uh, well, I mean, when you look at a lot of the other painters that you have in your book, mm -hmm. you know, they are describing or they're, they're painting farms. You know, they're not just painting the, you know, Algoma Park or, mm -hmm. you know, the Algonquin Park or anything mm -hmm. like that, but they're, they're actually painting farms. You know, they're, they're painting where uh, their ancestors or, they're, they're contemporaries, you know, they're farming, they're, they're mining, they have particular jobs, but they're, 
they're trying to get a sense of just what is it that they're expressing and thinking about mm -hmm. and how do they, um, they, are they trying to live with the land? And when I saw this as well, I thought very closely and I was just trying to examine it and just trying to get a sense of perhaps maybe this is what it is. It's kind of demarcating the land. It is, it is, mm -hmm. it is a very subtle way of, of describing of how the land is being, um, being used, right? Being yeah. settled. And yeah. how, do, how, do we, how, do, how do I express my piece of land? And, and what does it mean to me? You know? and, and so yeah. I felt that this is one way in which he was doing this. Mm -hmm. And that this, this tree is actually performing this function of demarcating a boundary of settled lands, landscape rather than being just a tree in its own world. Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing I was thinking about with the stories in the land, you know, when I was thinking about um, how the, the painters or indigenous peoples have stories in the land, because I was trying to do a bit of research on Fitzgerald and where he lived and that his family came to a place called Snowflake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in Better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Down near the border. Yeah, exactly. And I was trying to think, well, what is there? So I did a bit of research and I, and I, I came across some archeological uh, texts that would talk to describe um, these, these really uh, weird formations that they thought were probably placed here by indigenous peoples mm -hmm. thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And there were these mounds and uh, there's a particular mound I think that's in Snowflake. And so it just prompted me to think more about, about you know, the, the, when we think of the land and how we describe the land and how did people live on the land, they lived it in, in different ways and described it in different ways. And uh, so when we, when we do analysis of painting, when we look at and do research about these works, it actually takes you into a different world. Yeah. Because to me, it wasn't just describing this painting and try to think about it, what does it mean to me? But what it, what it then led me into this discovery of uh, Southern Manitoba. And then even further to that, you know, what was here thousands of years ago? Well, there was these mounds that were built by indigenous peoples for various reasons, you know? So, yeah. so this is the kind of thing that I like in the research that uh, certainly you having me write something prompted me to think about that, that there, there are different presences here that go on. This yeah. is just one of them that, that is on this land. Well, that landscape was his grandmother's farm. And he used to go there every summer for months and months. And I think he was very much left to his own devices. So I think Fitzgerald ended up having an extremely powerful relationship with that landscape. And uh, you know, I think you can feel that when you when you see this painting. It's really quite a wonderful, wonderful thing. Gerald, thank you. And thank you yes, again. Yes, you're for welcome. The essay. It's just wonderful. Now we have to talk about the next one. But anyway, we'll save that for off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to talk about the next one. So, so Gina Aurora has been one of my favorite Toronto painters for decades now. And uh, Gina broke the land speed record for essay writing because we were literally going to press. <laughs> and I suddenly, I was, I don't know, fiddling around online and I suddenly thought, oh my God, Gina. And, you know, I need to have that strong female painter's voice in this book. And Gina is the amazing paint handler extraordinaire. She has a passion for color. She's got a wonderful loose handling and, and a crazy imagination and knows the history of art like nobody's business. So I phoned her up on a Friday afternoon of a summer long weekend and said, Gina, you know, can you basically cancel your life for the next 48 hours? Because I really need you to write about this crazy painting by, by Thompson. Uh, and to my astonishment and eternal gratitude, she said yes. So this is the this is the picture. Um, it was it was again literally we the trucks were backing up with the load of paper when she was writing this, and she did such a beautiful job. But you know what a what a great uh, painting she had um, to write about. So Gina, tell us about painting. You know about this the essay, the thoughts you had about this picture but also about being a woman painter in Canada and being interested in landscape and painting into this tradition of the group of seven. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I, um, 
I first wanted to say that I love the book and I read Thanks. the book from cover to cover and I love everybody's essay because it's, it's very interesting to see all the different viewpoints. And um, it brings the group of seven back to me again at this age and this time in my life. And I am second generation Canadian, so I grew up in Canada. And I, um, I, I came to the group of seven through being in grade two in the library and seeing an Emily Carr painting. So mm -hmm. I came through the women surrounding the group of seven maybe. Um, also, um, to get back to your question about, you know, the, the 48 hours of writing the essay, I was, I had also just spent um, the summer up in, um, off Georgian Bay. And so I hadn't been painting, but I'd been thinking about painting and I'd been reading and researching a lot about painting. And um, when I got your call, I had, I had company and I don't have Wi-Fi or internet up there. So I came home and luckily I called you back a day later because I would have probably told all my company to leave that weekend. I have to write an essay. So <laughs> David, they're flipping the hamburgers. Yeah. But I also think that I, I um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have time to waffle and I had to get right to it. And I kind of think this painting I, it fell into my lap and it's like me, it had, it was done quickly. Right. And I, and kind of beautiful things come out of that sometimes. And, and I, I never really seen this painting, but um, now I, you know, I love it. And, and every time a painting comes up on the screen through this talk, I say, Oh, Oh, that's my favorite. Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> uh, I can't, I can, it's so hard for me to pick because they're so different and, um, you know, amazing. Anyway, um, so the thing I started to do when you called was to do the crazy thing, which, you know, people do when they're asked to write is in a research beech tree. So the first thing I did was look at beech trees when I knew this was beech grove. And um, to my amazement in the um, encyclopedia, Canadian Encyclopedia, a photograph came up from 2010 that literally looks almost exactly like this painting. So as much as this painting is brushstroke and dab and quick, and it, it also captures um, the reality of what was most likely actually, it was shocking photo. And one of the things that beech trees have, I was wondering why these um, tree trunks were all white and mm -hmm. silvery. And one of the um, one of the things it said in the encyclopedia was that the tree trunks were silver and dense, and the trees were tall, and they had canopies, and they um, grew close together, and sort of protected the ground from other trees intruding in the ground and also mm -hmm. from the sunlight dappling through. So I was thinking that, you know, this, this painting is very much that way. We have like a stand of trees mm -hmm. and, and we're not really invited to go in there. There's, it, it's almost like a straight painting, you know, it's almost keeping us out. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was one of the things. And, um, you talk in your essay about those dabs of blue at the back. Yeah. And I hadn't, I hadn't really noticed those so much, but you know, yeah. you make a strong argument that those, those little hits of sunlight coming through the back there kind of make the picture. Yeah. I think, you know, there's about, I was, there's about eight or nine dabs at the top there and they really open the painting up, you know, like without those dabs, the painting would be really quite closed and dark. So for me, it, you know, the painting is, is, it sings because of those little blue dabs and, and also because of the other dabs, like on the ground, there's green and maybe mauve. And in the forefront, there's the two, two trees leaning together and then the uh, shadows, you know, of the one tree on the other. It's almost like they are, um, they're protecting each other or there's like a communion there. Of, communion with each other, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, it's almost, um, yeah, so that's, 
and so the you know the the light in the painting comes exclusively for me you know from from the reflections on the trees but also from those dabs at the top which are open the sky up mm -hmm. so um the thing that I love about this painting is that Thompson gives us a sense of life um, in the moment and maybe in, in also in what came before and preceded this. So I, I've been reading um, Wallace Stevens and I was reading Wallace Stevens through the summer again. And so that really resonated with me because in one of his poems, he wrote, um, it's from Sunday morning, he wrote, remembering the bow of summer in the winter branch. And that really resonated with me with this painting because, you know, in this case, it's the autumn branch, but, mm -hmm. you know, we, we remember the, the, the tree, it holds all the past and all the present and all the seasons and the way things are constantly revolving and there's, you know, change and it's always, um, never stopping. So one of the things I thought with this painting was it was done in 2016 and it was probably the last fall that Thompson was alive because he he had died in the spring the spring of summer spring yeah. summer of 2017 and I was thinking how you know this this painting sort of captures that there's sort of a, a sadness you know there's a there's a like a this is this is maybe late in the autumn and maybe this he's going to have to go back to Ontario and sh and you know shut down so maybe there's a I'm kind of city. yeah yeah you know I watched for this moment after you know sort of living in this painting with you while we were editing it and thinking about it subsequently I watched for this moment uh, this fall um, and there is about a five day period when the leaves are all down but they haven't rotted yet and uh, Ian, um, Eric and I were sending each other photographs of leaves day one, day two, day three, and we were, were color fanatics. But, um, you know, there, there's this moment when the trees are all down, the sky is visible, but they still have their color. And it just is over like that. But I, I feel like that's the moment that, that Thompson is capturing here. And I think it's, it's so like him to, to be able to create an image that's so specific you know, about the time that it's painted. And I think that's what Ian was talking about, Petawawa Gorges, that, you know, that suite of paintings that Thompson makes about Petawawa Gorges, because it's every time of day, every time of year, you know, you can feel the temperature shift as you move from painting to painting. I mean, I do think that's going to be an extraordinary part of our exhibition, Ian, is, is going to be being able to pull those paintings together and, and see just how precise the notations are of color and the angle of the light and so on. But anyway, Gina, you did such a fabulous job with this essay. I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, grateful to you. And I, and I feel like I have an intuition that you're probably spent an awful lot of time running around in the woods when you were a little girl. I'm not sure about that, but you seem to know your way around a tree or two. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did, I did come to the McMichael as a young um, did you? girl as well. Yep. And my, uh, my mother actually sat beside A.J. Casson on a bench there. Ah. Huh. Yeah. What did so, they discuss? Does history tell? Pardon me? What did they discuss? Does history tell? She told me that um, she didn't know who he was. She <laughs> sat beside him and they he was sitting in front of one of his paintings and people were walking by and, and some people were saying nice, kind things and other than awful things. Oh, no. And just... <laughs> Sort of nodded to him and said, "Oh, people are quite quite opinionated." And he said, "Yep, that's the way people are when they look at art." <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh that's God, <laughs> Jennifer, it's like that. It must be awful to go to the movies and sit there and listen to people talking. Right? <laughs> they're usually they're usually raving, so you don't have to worry too much. But uh, yeah, that's wonderful, Gina. Thank you. And our our last visitor um, into this book is John Sasaki. Who, who chose this fantastic uh, painting by MacDonald. And John uh, is a conceptual artist based in Toronto, makes works in all sorts of media. Um, he would be my pick for at least likely to be interested in the group of seven, just knowing your work, John, before I got to know you better, because you, know, you, were, you were obviously not known for painting, 
but also your work is of a highly conceptual and, and intellectually abstract nature. And yet when I, I, I knew a little thing about you because I know you've been working on a project that we're gonna be showcasing at McMichael. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what made you um, want to write about this particular painting by McDonald, which is so beautiful when, when I gave you your pick? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. I, um, maybe I should admit that I, I actually have a past life as a landscape painter. And when I was, when so I was in my you're in, you're in a safe space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not embarrassed. Uh, when I was in my teens and my twenties, I uh, I was actually quite a group of seven fanboy, and um, yeah, I just you know just constantly tearing pages out of their book. And I didn't yeah. have a canoe, but I had a little a, a little red moped and a painting box that was uh, homemade, and I would kind of strap it to the back of this uh, this moped and drive it down dirt roads looking for like scenes to paint and what was uh, the landscape that you were roving around in was it this was out in New Brunswick and New Brunswick. Okay. yeah anything that looked kind of bucolic and vaguely group of seven-ish I would uh, sort of sit on a hillside and, and try and uh, do a little oil sketch of it so um yeah I don't, I don't want to create the impression I was any good at it but it was um I feel like I learned enough about it to know how hard it is to do a plein air sketch of uh a nighttime scene, like this nocturnal scene just blew my mind when I saw this. Um, and it was just this, uh, I think it's kind of stemming from like having tried to do this and failed many times. Um, I don't know, it, it felt like like J.E.H. McDonald had performed some kind of magic trick to like to, to make this look so kind of immediate and just so of that moment. And uh, and I don't know how he did it because I, I tried, like I, you know, I, uh, I would go out at nighttime with my oil paints and I would pick a nice scene and wait for my eyes to adjust with like to, to the natural available light and you know make a couple of observations and then you know then I would have to look at my palette in order to mix up a paint color mm -hmm. and of course you know you can't do that in the dark so I would have a flashlight or whatever <laughs> of course your eyes uh, you know adjust to the flashlight and then you're constantly kind of going back and forth and yeah um and it's like this really kind of cumbersome and clumsy uh, process. process and yeah, yeah and then and then I look at this and it's just so like it's like everything about it is right and I don't know so, I was so effortless yeah, yeah. You know, a beautiful story about you know I think one of the things that a number of writers in the book did, did was talk about you know personal memories that the painting took them to and you tell a story about standing outside your your family cottage and looking up and seeing the northern lights and mm -hmm. thinking you would it would be something you'd be able to see any old time and that very specific moment and did you uh i've never seen it again no this was this was um a one-time thing when i was about what, 10 years old roughly we were up at the family cottage and like my dad was out on the lawn i was inside and my dad like, uh, like called me outside and said uh Check this out. And there was, um, you know, we looked up at the sky and there was like this really beautiful aurora borealis. And, you know, it was like, it didn't look like this. It was like kind of the more, sort of more what I think of as green like northern light. Yeah, like kind of the undulating green curtain. Looks like, you know, a sheet on a, a laundry line. And, um, you know, I, you know, I took it in and I was, I guess, I don't think I was gobsmacked by it, but I, you know, I thought, oh, that's, worth looking at and after a couple of minutes I went back inside just assuming that I could always go outside again and see the northern lights from that lawn but it, it never happened again and um, yeah that's what, sort of one of the things I, I wanted to get across in the essay is like these these sort of last times that were mm -hmm. you know maybe people didn't realize at the time that it was the last time but um, it's only sort of in hindsight um, and the reason I mentioned it apropos of this painting was it was uh, uh, done on J.E.H. McDonald's final trip up to Georgian Bay. So this is a, a scene called Aurora Georgian Bay Point au Barrel. Mm -hmm. so it was his last time too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, well, it's a, a very, very beautiful and heartfelt essay. We're, we're so lucky to have you share it with us. And, you know, I, I do think your engagement with the Group of Seven is intriguing. And I, I just wanted to share with people who are joining us here tonight something that, that they may not immediately identify as related to the group of seven, <laughs> which is your, your marvelous sort of quasi landscape-esque photographs that you've been making 
from um, bacterial cultures that you have removed from various objects that are in our Michael collection that have been hatched by members of the group or sub a group. So this is a kind of um, process of homage that you've engaged in for seven years or so. Can you just quickly tell us a little bit about the project and I'll flip this back on again. Absolutely, yeah. So this was, uh, that was actually an image of, um, of McDonald's painting box. So this is like an object that he would have handled with his hands. And you know, I, I imagine that there's still possibly some sort of residue from that process like still on the handle. And um, so yeah, I spent like an amazing afternoon in the vaults with uh, the conservator, Alison Douglas. And we were you know, pulling out pallets that belonged to Tom Thompson or to Harris and this, this amazing painting box. And uh, yeah. Arms gold puke. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Arms gold puke down there. There's, there's some amazing objects in the collection, but um, yeah. yeah, I feel very privileged to have worked with them. So I was, I was taking like these sterile swabs and um, swabbing any kind of you know, bacteria or yeasts or funguses off of the boxes or the pallets um, in places that uh, the artists would have touched. And then growing these cultures in, uh, in large petri dishes and just sort of stepping back and seeing what would come out of it. And um, one, one for each of the original seven members of the group of seven plus Tom Thompson. And um, some of them are just stunning like this. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a Rorschach test. Like I kind of imagine a maybe possibly a nocturnal landscape here, but- um, it Has a certain intergalactic feel. To it <laughs> yeah. That makes yeah. it quite compatible with the, with the painting that you chose. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be showing these photographic works along with um, the, um, the boxes and the palettes and paint brushes that, that uh, John has been working with in our, in our vaults um, this summer. Uh, it'll be a small exhibition in the, in the Founders Lounge at McMichael and we, we do really hope you will all come and join us and see it. We're all on the other side of this um, moment that we're in right now, the great pause, I think we're going to probably call it. Um, sounds better than lockdown to me. But um, John, thank you so much again for sharing uh, such a tender essay with us and for thanks in advance for um, sharing your, your more contemporary um, uh, reflections on the group of seven in this series of works. And it's, it's it, to me, you know, the reason I wanted the project, you know, for the McMichael is that it really, you know, Harold Bloom talks about the anxiety of influence. And influence is influenza, is what he says. It's like besets the artist, and you're always trying to figure out who you are and what cultural production is in the wake of a great, you know, the great precursors of the past. And I think for subtler artists, and you know, certainly you're telling us you started out in painting, the shadow of these artists falls very, very dark and deep. And I think you've come up with such a unique and original way of responding to that legacy. So, again, thank you for talking about that with us. Thank you, Sarah. And, yeah, yeah and pleasure. thank you all for making such incredible contributions to this book and to all the writers that joined us in this project. Uh, we were so lucky. It was such a blast to work with everyone. And Ian, your, your introductory essay is just um, a classic. It's so funny, it's so informative, and it's full of surprises. So anyone who thinks they know all about the Group of Seven has another thing coming. So um, with that, I think I'll turn back. I think, Grace, you're taking the reins from here. Can I just interrupt slightly? Of course. Uh, um, Jory, just to say farewell. I'm really sorry. I have to go. I'm giving another lecture. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm going to have to go with what's left of my ragged sore throat and uh, bore everyone's death in Kelowna for an hour and a half. <laughs> so my it's thanks. Wonderful. My thanks to you all. It's been really fascinating listening to you all. And um, I hope you all love the book as much as I do. And my apologies not to be around for the question and answer, but I really have got to dash. So I'll wave goodbye at this point. Here you Bye. Have fun out in Kelowna. <laughs> Bye, Ian. <laughs> Art history never sleeps, folks. You know, we're uh, building exactly. night oil over here. Around the clock. The, the really brutal thing is when you agree you know, eight months ago to do a talk in Vancouver at, at you know, yes. seven o'clock. And then you realize, <laughs> look, I did last week twice, the seven o'clock in Vancouver. That was not good. That was not a good week, but anyway. Well, we're, uh, we're all over here working hard to bring uh, art history across the country, right? So yeah. uh, 
Thank you, Sarah, and all of the panelists for those absolutely fascinating conversations. And thank you, everyone who's tuning in right across the country and around the world um, for getting your questions and comments in. And we do have time for a few of them. So we'll turn to those quickly now. And uh, if you missed any part of the conversation or have to drop away, it is being recorded and you'll be able to catch up on what you missed in the coming days on our YouTube channel or on our website. Um, so let's turn to a few audience questions now. The first one that comes in asks, did any of the group of seven directly nod to the indigenous peoples of Canada in their work outside of maybe uh, Emily Carr, not a member of the group, but in their yeah. stuff? Maybe Sarah uh, or Gerald. Yeah, sure. On this. I mean, Gerald, let's, let's do this one together. I, I, I'd like to go back, everyone close their eyes so you don't get sick to your stomach. I'm taking you on the, the speed walk through Canadian art here. Um, to this spread, which we didn't really talk about much, but it's, it's, you know, both of these paintings are paintings about Indigenous culture. Port Essington, which is a community um, uh, that uh, at this point was starting to be in decline. The title of the work is a uh, moted uh, verbiage, but Indian House Port Essington and Mount Roche de Boule in Hazelton, BC with the um, indigenous canoe in the foreground. Um, there, there is um, occasional suggestions of the indigenous sort of priority on the land. And I think, you know, I think these are actually quite sophisticated pictures. Um, the critique around them, I think Gerald would be that they evoke a, a land emptied of indigenous presence, but that could either be a good thing or a bad thing for a settler artist to notice that absence. How, how does this yeah. strike you? Well, I was thinking that Ian did bring up this, this notion that uh, of the empty land, or I think some would say terra incognita, yeah. where there is nothing here which enabled settlers to come in and take over basically. Yeah. And so in a sense, I mean, when you think of the uh, group of seven painters, I mean, human beings are largely absent, you know? I mean, I mean, we did see a number of the works tonight, uh, but I mean, there is an indigenous presence if you look for it. Yeah. It's all in the land. <laughs> yes. You know? uh, do you have to have a figure of yeah. an indigenous person, you know? And even in the figure of an indigenous person, such as uh, J.H. McDonald's, uh, on the warpath, yeah, so stereotyped, so stereotyped, yeah. right? Uh, even the uh, the ten war canoes becomes a stereotype. Mm -hmm. There is one by Varley, uh, which I thought was kind of touching, called mm -hmm. a windswept shore. Yes, in which he did, and you know, it kind of reminded me of the present. Uh, well, he's no longer a contemporary, but he's passed on, and that was uh, Arthur Schilling, who was from yeah. Rama himself. Yeah, and we there's have this kind of uh, at the gallery right now. Yeah. yeah, there's a shared sensibility in their painting approach. So, but there's a very subtle reference of indigenous peoples, which I thought was kind of interesting when I guess back to my idea that the, they, are, they are of the land, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, you don't have to be, uh, um, you know, transplanted, but you, you know how to be in the land. So that the way he painted them, it's almost camouflaged, like they are of the land. That's and I right. thought that was kind of interesting, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that, that uh, painting like a hundred times when I came to McMichael because it was hanging in one of the galleries when I arrived uh, without even seeing that figure. And one day I was walking past that painting and I was like, huh, <laughs> that woman <laughs> with, with a blanket around her shoulders, you know, there she was. But what's interesting yeah, is there are, two there are two figures behind two figures her too. There. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two figures behind her walking along just, uh, you know. But <laughs> in terms of, uh, in terms of this idea, I think that that's, um, it's, you know, when they were painting largely when they came together in 1920s, you know, just after the war, uh, and when, and during this time when we think of uh, what Hollywood and the films were doing, Hollywood was just beginning, hadn't really, had really started, but the early films of Flaherty or, or, yes. or um, Edward Curtis who were trying to depict this, the indigenous people of, of a certain period, mm -hmm. Um, you know, they were thinking of indigenous peoples with, uh, like the painting on the warpath, you know, this kind of vision of a past, you know, a lot of size, indigenous peoples, but... 
But the yeah. indigenous people of the present looked like you and me. They just had yeah. brown skin. They were dressed like you and me. So perhaps they didn't quite make the, um, I don't know, the stereotype or the image that there was required. So that it wasn't an interesting su enough subject to include indigenous peoples in the, well, it's you interesting. Know, other than perhaps, yeah. On the war path and those other work, unfortunately we're talking about works that we can't look at right now, but you can see there's a spread of them in the book if you get the book. Um, you know, they are very stereotypical, but they're earlier than these pictures. So to, what, what intrigues me is that Jackson, when he paints this, this um, painting of Mount Roche, I, I do find it, you know, a very far cry from on the war path in terms of the fact that that canoe seems to fit in that landscape in a way that is like fundamental to it. Like it, the, the brushstroke that makes the canoe and the brushstroke that makes the mountain are one and the same kind of gesture. There's a sense of that canoe like knitted into that space. And there's nothing yeah. to me, there's nothing to me kind of, you know, histrionic or exoticizing about that this painting of, of this war canoe, to my eye at least. Yeah. You know, that's very yeah, matter of fact. And like, I think that Jackson had been traveling in the back country and he'd been exposed to more and he'd come to have a very different view of indigenous culture over the years in between those two, you know, those two paintings. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and we're still obviously, I mean, he made a progress in his, in his understanding of the country, I guess, in those years. And that's a trajectory that still is, you know, rolling on today. We're still learning and trying to figure out how to understand each other. But I, I, I saw this painting. I saw this photograph uh, a few years ago. It might have been in Toronto Star, Globe and Mail. It was of uh, Lauren Harris, and he was standing with this indigenous guy. And it was when La Harris went down to New Mexico. Yeah. And he was in Taos, New Mexico, and and of course, and I can't remember the date of it, but of course, him going to New Mexico during this time is when around the time George O'Keefe and many other painters were going into New Mexico and painting the landscape of New Mexico. Uh, and we've come to see uh, this land through the lens of kind of transplanted Europeans or, or New Indians, much the same as the group of seven. Mm -hmm. So you see the land and this for, formal qualities of the land through this lens. And, and, I, and, I, and I thought about that and I was trying to figure out more about Harris's trip to New Mexico, what he was doing there and who he was meeting with. And it was an interesting painting. I, I would have liked to have known who the indigenous guy was from Taos. And uh, just that period, I think was an interesting period of the 1920s, both in Canada and the United States uh, and with, with relation of indigenous and settler communities at that, at that time. And, uh, but it was just an interesting moment, I thought. Yeah, and ways in which modernism really drew inspiration from those cultures and maybe misappropriated it. But there was a, definitely a frisson between those worlds at that time that had an enormous impact, I guess, on both cultures going both mm -hmm. ways. Thank you, Sarah. Thank yeah, you, Gerald. Yeah. For those yep. interested in seeing some of the paintings that um, Sarah and Gerald were discussing, you'll find many of them in, in this book uh, in a beautiful color corrected format. Um, and of course, lots of fodder here for future exhibitions too. Um, the next question is a bit of a consolidation of a number of questions and comments that have come in uh, for each of the panelists. And all of your essays and, and conversations tonight describe a very embodied or physical response to the work that you're writing about. Gina, you talk about imagining Thompson sitting in the beach grove for hours on end, just shifting ever so slightly as the light changes. And Jennifer, you, you said earlier about touching trees, tree trunks out on your walks in Garibaldi Park and wondering if you were the first person to have touched that tree. Gerald, you write about all these personalities of the wind and John talking about your, um, your maybe uh, underwhelming at the time <laughs> vision of the Aurora Borealis and how uh, special that became later on and sort of reimagining it. I'm wondering if you could each say a few words about um, your physical responses to the paintings that you were writing about. Was it unique to these landscapes or is that normal for how you normally respond to a work of art? If you could say a few words, maybe Gina, we'll start with you. Okay, so one of the things 
that I think about a great painting is when you stand before it and you're silent and still, um, it's like it connects to you or it time travels, you know, it comes forward um, to the moment that we look at it, it travels down this corridor and then it, it, it um, we, we travel towards it and it travels towards us at the same time. And it becomes, you know, as relevant today as it was when it was made. And it also harkens to the past. So that's, that's my, when I think about um, Tom Thompson sitting in the Grove painting, I, I could feel that I, I feel that I'm there with him, you know, that I'm, I- The take us there, sorry. Yeah. I'll cover their eyes. <laughs> And really, you just have to look at a painting in silence and quietly and not say anything and just look at it. Even if you did that for 10 seconds right now, we could, we feel the connection, you know, and how it time travels. So that's, that's mm -hmm. it's a very I'm visceral, a painting is a very visceral thing to experience. And I think that really comes out in the writing. Yeah, like in, in, in particularly this painting, I mean, how can a stroke be a tree and be a brush stroke and be light and be be everything all at once and somehow it is it's magic right so mm -hmm. absolutely and Jennifer how about you Sarah can you put it up so I can look at it again because when I was, oh, yes. I was um, writing it I had it oh like I had this picture on my computer all the time and and propped up and I you know, there, there's something about, um, I wrote about this a little bit in the essay, but there's there's a contradiction in this, in this painting, which is density and openness that mm -hmm. I, I, I found really powerful because it was exactly what that landscape was like. Like when you grow up, the Pacific Northwest rainforest is, it's unbelievably dense, you know, like it just yeah. has this, this density to it that you could you feel like you could be swallowed up in it, which is not a, a negative thing. I, I actually kind of like the idea of being completely like enveloped and just sinking into the earth somewhere underneath a giant tree. But here there's also that the openness, like the density of mountains, but the openness of the sky. And when you go up in these landscapes, it's exactly this kind of paradox and the tension between those two things, the density, the openness, the permanence of the mountains, the kind of, you know, mm -hmm. the heavens, like the sky just going up forever. And I, um, it, it took me a long time to understand and appreciate what, and please don't uh, be offended those uh, Ontarians when I say this, but the subtlety, <laughs> the subtlety of the beauty in the, in the Ontario landscape, because I was so used to um, this, like, this just like overwhelming, um, Not conscious. Line. yeah, so, yeah. so, so for me, it takes me right back to that moment of, of, of touching the air, um, the, the air places, mm -hmm. and then descending back down the trails into the density of the forest again, and, uh, you know, to me, the paradox is what I love about it. Mm -hmm. And Gerald, that, that ties in exactly with what you're saying too in your essay and, and what you were talking about driving from the prairies into Ontario and losing that sort of sense of openness in the sky and the heavens to, as Jennifer said, sort of a subtler uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was also thinking of uh, a, f a few years ago, uh, going with a group of students and a professor to Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, in the fall sometimes because all the leaves had fallen. And the exercise was to go on what they called forest bathing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have done that. And uh, you know, just by slowing down your actions to a, almost a crawl, but you're still going through the trees reminds me of, of just experiencing perhaps even looking at a lot of these paintings you know you look around you 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 feel well you feel the wind of a little bit of wind but you 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 see so much more and i think that that was the um because you're looking around you're seeing 
you know, you're just moving really slowly. It's like that big tree. <laughs> you're yeah. moving slowly, looking around and, and uh, thinking in a very different manner. And I was thinking the same way. Um, years ago, I did a short essay on, on a similar kind of approach, but I was, I was kind of critiquing people going through the prairies mm -hmm. because I was saying that people drive through or fly through or go by yeah. train and they just find it completely boring. They fall asleep, you know, and, but I'm from there and I never find it boring. And so I said, just imagine if you were to slow down at the pace of you riding on a horse or a buggy or walking, then all of a sudden you see the world vastly different on the prairies. And I think that that was the idea that I was trying to get at that you start to understand the aesthetic of the prairie rather than behind the glass of a car and that. And so this idea of the forest bathing to me was just slowing down ever so much to get a sense of, of the trees, the leaves, the, the ground and everything around you, you know. And, uh, you know, you ought to try it sometime just in Hyde Park. It's a lovely place to go. And perhaps you might get a sense of the, of the G7 painters at the same time. <laughs> exactly. Well, Gerald, it's funny you talk about, you know, coming into that threshold of entering Ontario and the density of the trees. In Terrellick Duffy's essay for this book, she's responding to one of Varley's iceberg paintings, but she, she talks about the kind of panic that she felt when she came south from the Arctic to be, you know, in and around Ontario and, uh, or, you know, the, the south, you know, the part of Canada that most of us live in and just that sense of weight, you couldn't see where you were and you couldn't, you couldn't see where you were in, in, in situate yourself in the distance and the topography was all obscured by the trees and how terrifying she found that. So, I mean, we all have our own um, very embodied way of experiencing Canada. And I think really that's a big part of what the group of seven really excelled at. You know, even though in many cases they were looking at this landscape as newcomers, I mean, some of them were British people who had just recently emigrated to Canada, but that sense of bodily experience, I think is a great success of their work. And, I, and I'm, just, I'm certain that this is why they continue to compel us so much today, no matter, no matter who we are, you know, it seems like there's something we can share here. Absolutely. And John, last word to you. Do you want to weigh in on that question? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's been said quite well. I, I look at all of these works and um, they're just, they're transporting, I guess, for, uh, um, in a nutshell, like they kind of transport me to not only the place, but, you know, the, sort of a, a different time and they're just so incredibly evocative, I think, like my, my sort of memory of having been to Georgian Bay sort of fills in a lot of the blanks for me. So I, you know, like I can almost sort of, you know, smell the air and feel the wind and hear the mosquitoes in my ear. Yeah. It's, it's just, um, it feels like kind of a, I don't know, like a, like a mini vacation. If I can just sort of stop and, and be immersed in it which is actually really nice in COVID times when I haven't really been able to leave the city as much as I would like to. It's, it's nice to be able to sort of stand in front of these and, and sort of imagine myself in a different place. And um, We'll be yeah. back there soon. We'll be back there again. That's Just right. Take a little more time. And on that note, we're, we're out of time for today, everyone who's been tuning in. Thank you again so much. Sarah, perhaps a few final words from you. Um, one final question that you might want to say a line on is how does this publication differ from previous ones on the same subject? And uh, I think tonight's presentation has made an argument for that in more ways than one. Um, but maybe you want to say a few more words on that as we say goodbye to everyone. Yeah, well, I, I just think that, you know, what we were so excited about doing was trying to dust off the cobwebs and oopsie, I don't know how I managed to do that. Bear with me for one minute you know, try to dust off the cobwebs and, um, you know, find, um, find a way of having people see these paintings afresh and not be, um, you know, immediately turning the page because they think they know the group of seven that's something that they feel they know and they're familiar with and they have nothing more to learn. Right, to make the familiar new and strange. And part of that was through all the different perspectives in writing. And part of it was, as I mentioned at the outset, just really um, working hard to really bring to people on the printed page, the vividness, the, the particularity 
of these artists and how they saw color and form and shape. But really, honestly, the color is such an extraordinary part of it. And it's the color that gives us these very specific physical sensations of, of time of year, temperature, time of day, and so on. Um, they, they, they really um, connect us to close seeing. And again, you know, as uh, has been alluded to a couple of times tonight, it's just a, a time when, you know, Zen and the art of, you know, walking in the ravine or whatever we're all doing, wherever part of the world we're in, you know, availing ourselves of the natural world. I mean, the thing about the group of seven and Tom Thompson is that they were active in the aftermath of the last big epidemic, which was the influenza epidemic. And, you know, people took to nature at that time as well for solace. There were more deaths from the epidemic than there were uh, from the casualties of the war. So it was a, a huge humanitarian catastrophe. And um, nature was something that people really connected to deeply. So, you know, go outside, look up in the sky, hug a tree, come see us at McMichael. And um, thank you for being with us, I think, uh, Grace, that's probably all that I have to say. That's perfect. Thank you, Sarah. And on that note, uh, we'll say good night, everyone. Thank you again for tuning in. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Grab your copy of the book now for the holidays. Uh, give it a read and then go outside and take a walk. Thanks, everyone. We'll leave it there. Good night. <laughs>